Hi, gang. Uh, Math 6620, more on logistic regression. Uh, my, uh, one of the major projects I guess I was uh, involved in at Shawnee State was with the Occupational Therapy Group, who, by the way, are my all-time favorite people on this campus. Uh, I love working with them. And this is really the first time uh, that I worked with them was on this project. So anyway, there was a um, a third party who uh, gave us a, a, a sizable grant to investigate the relationship between some measurements that they had developed in false status. Now, let me explain a little bit what's going on here. First of all, here's the, the full data set. Well, uh, it's not a full data set either. It's a reduced data set, but uh, I think it includes 244 patients. Um, the ages, uh, let's just uh, look at it, uh, ran from 62 to 97. So we're dealing with an elderly uh, population. And what the patients had done is they had uh, reported under fall counts the number of times, and again, this is self-reported, so you know, uh, take this with a grain of salt, if you will, a uh, number of times that they had fallen in the past month. Well, what the, and, and what, what the, uh, the, the funders of the grant uh, wanted to do is they wanted to dichotomize fall status in uh, to uh, had never fallen or had fallen at least uh, one time. So let me show you uh, what that looks like. So we had 142 patients who uh, had not fallen and then one or more patients who had fallen 102 times. Now, if we go up, uh, we look at... Um, fall counts. Well, that, let, let, me, let me just, just proceed as, as I was planning to do. So what I wanted to do or what they wanted to do is they wanted to predict fall status. And so I need to come in and, and let R know which um, what my reference category is. In other words, what I want to be coded as zero. And for my other categorical, in this case, predictor, I wanted to let the baseline be uh, does not use a cane. So some of the things, uh, just, just going through the variables, uh, age, fall status, the counts, number of medications they take per day, are they steady in the morning? Uh, can they stand without assistance? Can they dress themselves without assistance? Do they use a cane? Uh, how do they, they, they were given a feeling inventory and they have a score uh, on it. A higher score indicates uh, uh, feeling better. Uh, then there were this set of measurements, which I really don't understand some of these, uh, but they're open six, open eight, open TR, close, uh, reaction time, and up go. So these measurements that the people who uh, funded the grant wanted us to investigate using as a predictor of uh, whether or not a person would fall. So the first thing I did is I have a lot of clutter uh, in, uh, in in my data set. So what I did is I just wanted to collapse this down to the, to the variables that I was actually going to investigate. So I created a new data set, a new data frame. Uh, I called it new data. And um, um, then uh, attached it and just looked at the head. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I want to, uh, to look at the model and then I want to look at some model diagnostics and then we're going to transition into, um, uh, looking at some case wise diagnostics. We may get into, um, uh, so checking some assumptions, but I don't think I'll get to that, uh, in this video. So first thing I want to do is I want to create my null model. And uh, what I do there is just uh, predict uh, fall uh, from the intercept only. I really don't need to look at it uh, because I really don't care what the uh, null model looks like, but I'm going to bring it up uh, nonetheless. So uh, we can see that the intercept is statistically significant at the 0.05 level. So I think of the null model is if we were going to predict fall status just by flipping a coin. So the first subject comes to us. We don't care about his or her age, up go test, any of the measurements that we're using. We just flip a coin and decide 
beforehand, well, you know, what heads represent, what's tail tails represent, and we uh, predict their fall status uh, based on random chance. Uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to bring in my first model. Uh, so again, uh, GLM, and I want to predict fall from the predictors. So cane use uh, plus open eight plus close eight plus up go plus age. Now, uh, what I look at here is um, I have tunnel vision on my p-values, so I can see that age is a significant predictor of fall status. Uh, this measurement uh, is is close to the being significant at the 0.05 level, but I can see the cane comes in at uh, a level with a relatively high p-value. And it seems to bring nothing extra to my model. So I'm going to delete that. And again, I'm doing this just for illustration. Uh, if I had created uh, a theory or if the, 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 the people who are funding the grant wanted me to check cane status, open eight, close eight, up, go, and age, which they did, then I would report this model to them. But I have a little bit of flexibility here because I'm, uh, I'm uh, teaching. So uh, um, let's, um, all right, so let's go up and grab uh, model one and let's, uh, let's create model two. And I wanna get rid of the cane status because it doesn't seem to do much to my model. And then I want summary model two, all right? So when I uh, uh, look at this model, I see that again, uh, age is a significant predictor but none of the other uh, three predictors uh, emerge statistically significant. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to see if this model number two is a statistically significant improvement over the null model, which again is just predicting false status from a random chance. And it turns out I can do that very easily by using the ANOVA command. So I can just put in my null model and my model two. And you'll see that it gives me the residual difference for each of the models. This is the null model. This is the residual deviance for model two. And it summarizes it right here. So my difference in devious, deviance, residual deviance is uh, 9.97 with degrees of freedom four. Um, so what uh, I will do there. Uh, that surprises me. Uh, where is my null model? Um, okay, okay, it doesn't surprise me. Okay, so what I would do there is I'd need to calculate the, the p values. So uh, we follow the uh, chi square distribution for 9.9717 uh on four degrees of freedom the four degrees of freedom are the number of predictors that i have remember or i should say it's a number the change in the number of predictors i had no predictors in the intercept model only or the uh, null model and uh, in the uh, model two i have four predictors so that's the uh, reason for the degrees of freedom being equal to four so when i Calculate the p-value, it squeezes in under the uh, uh, the 0.05 level. So we have statistical significance. So we can conclude that this model is better than for predicting false status uh, than by chance alone. So what I would do with that uh, is over here, you can see that I've uh, created model two from the four predictors. And I can just say that the model uh, is an improvement over the null model and present uh, accordingly. It'll turn out that uh, <clears throat> if I check uh, the null model with model one, you'll 
you'll see that the model is not statistically um, uh, a statistically uh, improved model, if you will. I didn't say that really correctly. Uh, the um, model one is not statistic any, any more statistically reliable for predicting fall status uh, than the null model. So that's what I would call the model diagnostics. Um, and again, my coefficients for model two, uh, the only thing, and I'm, I'm gonna teach you in a later video how to report these and, um, and do some other pretty cool stuff. Uh, but this uh, predictor got my attention. Uh, I would probably end up deleting open eight if I was seeking uh, the best model and I think I would keep uh, that uh, predictor for sure. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to get into some uh, uh, influence, uh, DF betas, DF fits, um, and, uh, and, and show you how uh, this works. So the first thing I would, so really what I'm getting into now, uh, we'll examine uh, case-wise uh, diagnostics. So again, we've looked at the coefficients. We've examined them. We've examined the model diagnostic. Where is it? Right there. So model two is uh, is more uh, statistically reliable than our uh, null model. So now we're going to transition into seeing if there are any case-wise uh, issues. And I'll explain that to you as we go along. Uh, the first thing that I would want to do is I would want to create my fitted values. Now, let me explain to you what fitted is. Fitted, in this case, in the logistic regression, gives me the probability of, in this case, uh, falling. So if we want to predict the probability of a fall for patient number one, uh, we can go up to patient number one. And we can see that patient number one is 82 years old. They have a close eight of 9.29, an open eight of 97.55, and an up go of 8.50. Now, if we're going to calculate I'll tell you what, let me raise this up a little bit where it can be where it can be seen. Now, if we're going to calculate the probability, remember that for model number two, that our coefficients are uh, 2.68, uh, 0.01 for open eight, and so on. So remember calculating the probability. We take E raised to our model and insert the age, up, go, close, and so on and so forth. When I do that, I get 2.68 minus 0 0.035 times the age of uh, 82. And the last, uh, I think, is the up, go, 0 0.05917 uh, times the 8.5. So I get this. I just simplified it. So this turned out to be about actually about 1.12, depending on how we rounded. And um, so E raised to the 1.12 over 1 plus E raised to the 1.12 gives us a probability of 0.754. So what that tells us is that the probability of fallen, of falling one or more times when a person is 82, and they have these certain measurements on close eight, up, go, open eight, uh, and um, oh, the other one, what is it, uh, up, go. We have a probability of 0.754. Well, it turns out that this command makes all of that very simple. So if I do fitted, you'll see that I have uh, 0.749. Uh, which within rounding, actually, when I used the 1.0929731, uh, I got uh, 0.749 exactly. So that's off just a little bit uh, due to rounding. So again, the probability of the first patient, uh, someone with the characteristics of the first patient uh, falling is, uh, is pretty high, uh, about uh, 0.75. 
Now, the next thing I want to look at are um, residuals and standardized residuals. I don't think in terms of uh, uh, logistic regression that the residuals are really that uh, exciting, uh, but I'm going to go ahead uh, and get them anyway. And I just do that by uh, RES uh, ID model two. But what I do think is pretty interesting and helpful are our standardized residuals. And I can always find those by just using the R standard um, command. Now, my focus here um, standardize uh, residuals above uh, two or less uh, than uh, negative two. Uh, may be uh, problematic. So let's just take a look at the range of our standardized residuals. And we see that they range from negative 1.81 to 1.67, uh, which uh, means I have no concern with uh, the standardized residuals. Again, standardized residuals are a little uh, wacky to interpret in the logistic regression model, but nevertheless, it's, it stands for the difference between what we observe and what we predict in a standardized scale. Now, the next thing I want you to look at are the true case-wise diagnostics. So um, DF betas uh, are the first thing I want to look at. And what DF betas allow us to do is they allow us to uh, examine the change in our coefficients if that subject was removed. So uh, examine the change in coefficients. These things right back here, our estimates. How would those change if this particular subject uh, was removed? Uh, So we're going to have one for each person uh, in our model. Now, it turns out that DF betas are really easy uh, to calculate. Uh, we just use the DF beta uh, command for model two. And uh, as I put over here, uh, right over here, uh, our concern with DF betas um, uh, are when the absolute value of our DF betas are uh, greater than one. So I can just come in and look at the range of the DF betas. And I range from, um, you know, absolute value, uh, the highest would be 0.62. So I have no concern with DF betas. In other words, there's no reason for me to assume that if one of these um, uh, subjects were removed from the uh, data set, and we recalculated our uh, coefficients estimates uh, that there would be a, uh, uh, a reason uh, uh, for concern. The next thing I want to look at are called DF fits. And uh, what DF fits um, allow us to do is um, DF fits don't really focus on the coefficient. Well, I tell you what, DF fits and DF fits and DF betas are almost the same thing, except uh, DF fit uh, examines the change in the predicted probabilities if the subject was removed. So it's, it's again, it's very similar to DF beta, except DF beta focuses on the coefficient change. DF fit uh, examines the change in the predicted probability if the subject was removed. Uh, easy to find. Uh, okay, what's up with that? Okay. So just use the DF fits uh, command and um, we're easily able to to calculate those now when you take my math uh, it well if you take my math 6500 we dive into these um case-wise case -wise diagnostics uh a lot deeper we look at uh, some of the mathematics behind it 
Uh, but again, this is applied uh, an applied sequence, which is just getting you ready to conduct logistic regression in your uh, master's thesis. So we take a little different uh, approach. Now, DF fits, <clears throat> we set the threshold by taking 2 times the square root of k plus 2 over n minus k minus 2. And for this data set, we have um, tunnel vision on uh, uh, 0.318. Again, this kind of works like the 0.05 threshold for statistical significance. If we get a DF fit, DF fit that has an absolute value greater than 0.318, then uh, we should investigate uh, and strongly consider removing that case or cases. Now, so if we run, run a range on uh, DF fit, we can see that we run from uh, an absolute value up to 0.682. And again, the threshold here is absolute value of 0.318. So we have some issues that we need to examine here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to create a absolute value for my DF fit. And I do that by just taking the absolute value of DF fit. All right. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to write just a minor code that allows me to pull out the cases that have quote unquote high DF fits. And I have to, um, let's see, what do I have to do first? I have to, um, oh shoot, I forget, uh, tidyverse, yeah. I have to uh, access the library tidyverse. Now, if you haven't installed this previously, you're going to have to install the package. But what I can do now is I can, uh, uh, let's just call it uh, ID DF fits. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and my data set that I want to use uh, is, what did I call the data set when I read? Um, New data, okay. So I want new data, and then uh, I want to filter my uh, absolute value DF fit uh, greater than 0.318. So what that's going to do is it's going to going to take me back to my uh, my data set and it's going to identify the cases um, that um, hmm interesting it didn't bring the IDs along yeah it did uh, hmm I thought this would identify the um, hold on what's going on here Okay, uh, for some reason it's not identifying. I didn't bring along the ID. Okay, yeah, that, that was that was bad. What I should have done in the new data, I'll tell you what, let's do that. All right, so let's bring an ID. All right, now let's uh, go over that again. And now we can see the ID of the subject. So subject number one is uh, uh, has a DF fit uh, that is uh, that is high, and um, subject seventy two, and subject one hundred five. So we should investigate each of these cases uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Uh, if we want a new data frame that shows this, we could just add, uh, create another data frame and add ID uh, DF fits to it. We'd have an extra column out here, and we'd see the uh, the values. So, um, so anyway, uh, the next thing I'd want to do is take a look at uh, leverage values. And leverage values focus on our predictors. Uh, and kind of in a very simplified way, 
uh, allow us to see if there are any X predictors that are quote unquote outliers. Not exactly that, but in other words, are there any predictor values that uh, seem to be kind of uncommon, if you will? Um, so uh, these are um, uh, bounce back to something called the hat matrix. Uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot about that in 5500 if you haven't taken that yet. Uh, so leverages, uh, I'm just going to use the hat values for our model number two. Now, the leverages, a couple of schools of thought here, and I forget exactly who uh, proposes that anything greater than two times k plus one over n, where k is the number of predictors. So we have four predictors here, so uh, two over five uh, or I'm sorry, two times the five over our total sample size of 244. So we have a, a I guess a, um, a lower threshold of 0.041, a higher threshold of 0.065. Um, I would say this is you know a more conservative approach. I think for this class, uh, I use this one. Uh, I think Stevens around. Uh, I completed my PhD in. Uh, 2002, so I think it was around 2000 or so, maybe late 1990s, uh, that he uh, proposed this. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go with the point 0615, and for your homework assignments, I want you to do that as well. So uh, anything greater than 0.0615, uh, we should investigate uh, uh, a little further. So uh, range of the leverages and um, it actually turns out that there are a few, so uh, I would probably want to go back up and um, uh, let's see. So ID leverages, and I would want to filter uh, absolute value of leverages to see any that are greater than uh, 0.0615. It turns out we have quite a few cases. We have 10 cases that um, uh, we would need to investigate uh, closer. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by investigate closer? Um, well, first of all, 172 and 105 have my attention because they've shown up not only as uh, concerns for DF fits. Uh, we have none for DF uh, betas, right? Um, right. So I think I would, at this point, I would strongly consider uh, eliminating cases 172 and 105. Um, if I had any uh, leverages that were uh, pretty extreme, I may consider deleting those uh, as well. So now what do I mean by delete? Let me, make, let me make this clear. What I always do, my procedure would be to run and report the data set uh, with all 244 participants. Then I would transition into my case-wise diagnostics and I would say, after running my DF fits, my DF betas, my uh, leverages, that I have uh, three cases that are concerned, I'm going to delete them. And I'm going to re-report the analysis based on the remaining 241 subjects. And I'll let the reader de uh, decide. Well, one of my first studies, um, well, actually one of my first, uh, actually it was my second doctoral advisor, uh, uh, my second doctoral student. Now, I wasn't their advisor, but I served on their uh, uh, doctoral dissertation committee, advisory committee. Um, she had a small data set. I think it was 82. And she had one subject uh, who uh, was very influential uh, for all the leverages and DF fits and DF betas. This one subject uh, showed up a lot. Um, in fact, they emerged uh, on uh, all the case-wise diagnostics. And um, so I run a model uh, uh, with him in, uh, included, and I ran another without him included and reported uh, both of those.
So, well, it sounds like my uh, AirPods just died. So I think that's time to, to quit. So take care.